Welcome to the Attic Monologues, Episode 3, A Bird's Eye View. Note to future Nicks, 29th of September, shopping list, frozen peas, butter, eggs, tin tomatoes, chilli flakes. You're running out of milk, but check the back of the fridge before you buy any. You don't want any more going rancid. Pasta, you've eaten it the past five days. Actually, maybe don't buy pasta, so you have to pick something else for dinner. Hmm, no, just get the pasta. Quick ball edition. Or just buy some ready meals. Honestly, that might save... Nix! In here! Who are you talking to? My phone! Dare I ask? Can't be bothered to write my shopping list, so I'm recording it instead. That's actually a pretty good idea. Why, thank you. So, Lola texted the group chat again. Where's the fire this time? No fire yet, but we promised to have her and Seth over once we moved in, remember? Housewarming and all that. Well, as the most successful members of the group, it only makes sense they'd want to see our lovely new abode. The most successful? Because we're the only ones not living with our parents? That is a low bar. And also total bullshit. We're absolutely doing the worst. I don't know. We cooked a whole curry last night without burning down the kitchen. I'd call that a win. Hmm. I'll make sure to mention our burnt rice and undercooked onions when Lola comes over and hands me some homemade brownies and a casserole. She'll be so proud of us. It all tastes the same when we're off our faces. <laughs> oh, we could just do a movie night with absolutely no alcohol at all. What's the point? Well, you're explaining it to Sam when you christen the bathroom. I can hold my drink just fine. Lola's the one you need to worry about. So, let's hold off on the alcohol. Maybe we could convince him to cook dinner with us. The counter is currently buried beneath plates and pans. You really think we're going to get it cleaned up in time? You could stop picking holes in every plan I suggest. I could. A movie night sounds nice. And it will probably motivate us to clean up. After all, we have to convince them we're the most successful, right? We can't let them know we sit! <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you're putting it on the group chat. Why me? You're literally holding your phone right now. You can... Well, everyone better. They're our friends, Belle. They're not going to bite. I know that. Doesn't change the fact I've spent the last half hour overthinking a reply and deleting it a dozen times. That's rough, buddy. Yeah, thanks. I'll drop a message in the chat this evening. Then you can chime in and the conversation will get going. And we'll both be online so it won't dissolve into awkward cricket noises, even if the others don't reply. Thanks. I'm here any time. Though I still can't call the doctors for you, I'm afraid. Hmm. Suppose I'll just have to die then? I'll miss you terribly. If you don't play a handsome stranger called Death at my funeral, I'll be offended. Oh, of course. Followed immediately by Highway to Hell. I love you. I'm so lovable. Of course, if I expire first, you've got to promise. I'll sleep when I'm dead, followed by bury me face down. Don't worry, I've got you. I love you. I'm not at all lovable, but I appreciate it anyway. I'll fight you if you say that again. Is the kettle boiled? A few minutes ago, yeah. I'll make tea. You planning a monologue for this afternoon? Yes, I am. And yes, I've noticed your excruciatingly unsubtle digression, but I'm going to follow it anyway. Can you make me a cup too? Sure. Try all right. Sounds good. Okay, so I picked one out this morning. The speaker's named Corbin Blackwell and... Oh, shit, are you okay? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, sorry. It just wasn't watching my elbows. Give me a sec. I'll grab a broom. And, and some shoes for you. Don't, don't move. I'm not... Shit! Here. Thanks. There we go. Out of the way. <laughs> you should probably put it in the bin. We're out of bin bag. Damn. Another one for the shopping list. Future Nicks! Bin bags! You okay? Yeah. Um, you know when something happens and it just, like, throws off your entire day? Leaves you all jangled up? Yeah, unfortunately. May I distract you by dazzling you with a performance for your eyes only? The monologue? 
Hmm? If, if you like. Or I can throw all my afternoon plans out the window. We can go to the park and see the stars. The monologue. Uh, I'd love to listen to you. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Hang on. Oh, the recorder's already running. I really would lose my head if it wasn't already screwed on. I'll just... Right. This dude is Corbin Blackwell, an angry young man, disillusioned by the world. You ready? Boys, go ahead. I imagine I'm far away. In a place where no one knows me. Where no one expects anything from me. Where no one who does can find me, or stop me, or get in the way. I'm stood atop a cliff. And from here I can see forever. The sea breaks in curves of foam, hammers relentless, and the thinking against the chalk. It glints in tones of blue and grey and green, in a hint of a spectrum we could only dream of. And arcing above the inky depths of the sky, just beginning to get light as the sun drags itself up the horizon. I wonder, does it ever get tired? That same monotonous journey each day with no thanks, no reward. And one day it will sputter out, collapse under all that pressure, and we will blame it for the destruction that causes. Not the system that made this ruin inevitable. Not its creator, with every power to prevent the fall of the dominoes that led us there, who instead just sits and watches and dances in the flames. The grass beneath my feet is cool against my fevered skin. I imagine it reaching up to lace around my ankles, tie me down when gravity fails to do so. It would keep me here when I try to fly, catch me when I try to fall. It would show me visions of flowers, of clear skies and sunrise, just to distract me, waiting for the tree that might one day grow in my stead, fed by my rotting, stagnant form. A dream that will never come true. But there are some dreams that might. I imagine the scent of smoke on the wind. Ashes brushing past my cheeks and out to sea. I know what I will see even before I look. For my chest is light and I breathe easy. And the rocks far, far below don't call to me the same way they used to. I don't need to look to see the fire. Maybe I shouldn't look. Maybe it's supposed to make me feel sick. Maybe my heart should hammer in my chest, and I should cry, and I should sink to my knees as the cinders tangle in my hair and set my form ablaze. Instead, I turn to see the city in flames. I'm hundreds of miles away, stood here on these pale cliffs, yet there is nothing to block my view of a skyline crumbling to dust. The fire ravages each building in turn, climbing them with ease, gutting them from the inside out. It eats away at the night sky, angry and hungry and bright. I see dark figures stumbling through the carnage, screaming, and know with utter certainty that it was my hand that set them ablaze. The ash in my lungs is wood and brick and flesh and it settles familiarly, either side of my heart. The scent of flames has followed me for years. When I was a child, it was just a memory that wasn't yet mine. A dream I'd always had, of escape, of a clear skyline with nothing to halt my path. It kept me ablaze inside when the rest of me was dying and cold, locked in iron chains and anchored to obligation, tradition, the desperate smoking embers of a family inflated with self-importance. My father was deathly afraid of fire. It killed my mother, you see. Perhaps that's the more important part of this story. A smoking pipe left lit while she dozed on the sofa, which claimed the house in a matter of an hour. It consumed every trinket. Every book, every heirloom. It crawled the walls, climbed the stairs, twisted its limbs around support beams, chewed up bricks and spat them out in a scattering of char. My father was out at work, my sister at school. I was home with a feeder, or so I'd claimed. 
Truly, I just didn't feel like going to gym that day. My mother stayed home from work to look after me. I was in my bedroom at the time, eleven years old. Plagued already by my chains, without the vocabulary or rage to shake them. I was doing my best impression of a sick child, reading a new book beneath the covers of my bed, The Northern Lights. Went entirely over my head, but I loved it all the same. The image of a child running feral across rooftops, untamable. A soul that couldn't be contained, that could transform into anything it dreamt of. I've always loved that book. I feel as if it's buried somewhere deep in my heart, as if when it went up in flames, I inhaled every word. Maybe I only love it because I was reading it that day. Maybe if the pipe had flickered out, my mother had woken in time, I would have simply shelved it and carried on with the rest of my life. A loss of life can be explained away by maybes. Maybe the world should be softer. Maybe I should be kinder. Maybe those two things aren't connected at all. Maybe I was just born wrong. I live in those moments in between maybes, in the imagining, in the dreams of a different life, a different choice, a different death. It was the smell of smoke that found me first. That has lived inside my lungs ever since. I sometimes wonder if there really are clouds inside me, if I carry the debris of that old house, that old life, if that's the reason I'm anchored here. When it reached me, I didn't move. I was far too familiar with smoke. It already lived in our clothes, in the walls, in the stained teeth of my mother's smile. Even when the heat began to filter in, I assumed that maybe I'd done too thorough a job of making myself seem ill and given myself a fever. It was the sound that finally drew my attention. The groan of wood struggling as the structure was gutted. The hiss and crack of flames consuming the world. I emerged from my bed to find them already climbing the stairs, the floor creaking under my weight. For a moment, I was frozen. Mesmerised by their twist and curl. The way they seemed to dance and beckon me to join them. They were alive in a way I had never been, and despite the carnage around me, I was called to them. To my credit, I still tried to get downstairs. Maybe I was trying to find my mother, or at least save some of the priceless artefacts my father had cherished throughout his life. Maybe I hadn't quite lost my heart yet, back then. Or maybe I was simply answering the call. But fire is senseless and hungry, and within seconds it was reaching for my skin, my clothes, my breath. My lungs were heavy, my breaths mere impressions of air. I ended up throwing myself from my bedroom window. Quite dramatic, really. They found me wandering the garden, breathless, rambling, burnt. The worst burns are the ones you can't feel. The sort that will live with you forever, a mess of ruined nerves and gnarled skin. They offered me new nerves, new skin, to cover up the damage, but even then I clung to my scars. The small things that meant I couldn't fit into my mother's perfect jigsaw puzzle family. I hadn't felt the flames lick across my arm, but I felt the boil of my blood as it settled in my veins, in my heart, where it would live for years. My father was terrified of fire for the rest of his life wouldn't even light a candle or go near the gas cooker in the kitchen. My sister carried on with her stiff upper lip as if nothing had ever happened. She had responsibilities, after all, now that our mother's shoes needed filling. Maybe I should have been afraid. But the first time I struck a match and held it to a piece of paper, watched it curl and crumble in my fingers, I knew it was a part of me, and I could never hate it. Fear it, surely, but fear and awe are far too entwined to bother with semantics. Paper burns best, I learnt. Brittle autumn leaves burn well too. Wood is traditional, but takes too long, and leaves too much behind. 
Hair is like a flash fire, over in an instant, but the smell won't wash out for weeks. I lost my eyebrows more than once that way. Feathers are the most satisfying. They curl and scatter like gossamer, and even when they are nothing but ash, they can still float on the wind as they always have. I passed years that way, cultivating the flames, and by the time my father died, it was all I knew. The day he died was the day my life ended, though not for all the ridiculously sentimental reasons you might think. I was twenty. The world had been burning for nine years. My sister had already followed the path, begun to dress like our mother had, talk like our mother had, be our mother, as if wearing her skin might be enough to bring her back to life. Might be just as good as having her in front of us, holding us, tucking us into bed at night and telling us to follow our dreams. Not that she would have ever done that. Our mother was just as chained to her traditions, just as drenched in the stink of money and rot and distance as the rest of this collapsing bird's nest. So really, she's emulating our mother perfectly. Our father's death was nothing interesting. I hadn't been home in years. Didn't even know he was on his way out the door until I received the news. Maybe I should have felt something. Maybe I should have come home immediately. Instead, I set fire to the records building where he used to work. I'd already planned it, so I can't say it was an homage, really. But it felt like letting him go. And the smoke was enough to make tears fall from my watering eyes. I was hardly ever going to thank him for dying, but I certainly wasn't going to mourn him either. All this truly meant was an end to the freedom I'd cultivated the past few years, as the shackles of tradition passed from his wrists to mine. I imagined myself shifting form, sprouting wings. I am high in the air, high above a thickening of soot clouds. The forecast is supposed to be cloudless, and up above them all the sun has begun to blaze, the answering fires below a mystery, smothered by smoke. I dive through the clouds, eager to see the aftermath. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. When the volcano at Pompeii erupted, the city was covered in ash for thousands of years, buried and forgotten and utterly ruined. In 1815, Mount Tambora erupted, and the following year there was no summer, a volcanic winter that starved the world and gave birth to monsters. Here, flying above the ruins of a still smouldering city, I imagine the fallout of my rage to be that of the gods. I see the trees that line the roads, now little more than clouds of flame. I see the market stalls of belays, fabric and food and all sorts of trinkets turning black and blowing away in the wind. I see the law courts and the prisons and the schools turn to dust. All of it so brittle, so old and unchanging, that it must always have been meant for the inferno. I imagine the embers floating upwards, getting tangled in my wings. I imagine the sparks catching, consuming, until I am nothing but a blaze of burning feathers, a smudge streaked against the sky. It's only right that the fire burns through me too. Maybe this will finally be enough to tire it out. Maybe when the dust settles and the last cinders fade to black, I will be burnt out and hollow and achingly, desperately alive. I will feel something other than the steady boil of rage and the free fall of the void. Freedom is very rarely what we expect it to be, so I expect very little. I don't expect it to fix me. I don't expect it to pave over the last 22 years. I don't expect my hatred to be enough to smother the inevitable senseless grief I might feel in gutting my roots and learning to fly. I imagine flying, 
for years, for centuries. I imagine watching the last of the fires go out, high above, little more than a ghost made of ash and soot. I watch the remaining structures collapse and shift and settle. And slowly, I imagine life breathed back into the city. Nothing human, nothing broken. I imagine weeds shooting up from the remains of my sister's house, curling through her daughter's bedroom. I imagine flowers bursting forth from the bricks of council rooms, calling wasps and bees to feed on them. The world is ashen grey, the perfect canvas for colour. I imagine life breathed into a city that died long before it burned. I imagine my ashen form broken, finally, by a single gust of wind. The wind beneath my wings vanishes, and I am tumbling into freefall. I imagine myself as Icarus, the boy who fell from the sky when he reached too high for the sun, who had lived his entire life inside a tower because of his father's crimes, dreaming of freedom. Can you imagine anything worse than that? Trapped day in, day out, with the one person who caused all your suffering, who expects you to be grateful for existing at all, knowing that the sentence forced upon you, your life, your punishment, was by no fault of your own. Your parents looked at their lives and decided that another deserved to suffer with them. It is an inherently selfish act to bring a child into the world by choice. I wonder when Icarus's wings melted, was he relieved? He spent all his days looking through the window, watching Helios, god of the sun, trek thanklessly across the sky, trapped too in an endless cycle of days. He saw Poseidon, god of the sea, relegated to the waves by familial obligation as a supposed reward for his time spent trapped literally inside his father. And Icarus saw the tower for what it truly was, a microcosm of the world beyond the window. Leaving would only ever be exchanging one prison for another, overshadowed always by his great preoccupied father. The only true escape could be to burn it all to the ground. Let the feathers burn away and fall, fall as far as you can, and then fall further until they will never find you, never think to look for you, until you are unrecognisable and unchained and free. I imagine myself scattered across the world. I settle in the ruins I made to make something new of myself. I settle atop my cliff and the crushed grass left behind by my feet all those imaginings ago. I am cast far out to sea and as I tumble towards the waves the sun hits the horizon and explodes in tendrils of pink and orange burning across the sky breathing life into a new day. I fall in fresh, bright light, which catches the motes of my new form, sets them ablaze and spinning like planets. Whether I sink into the sea, or am borne aloft by the wind, I am a falling star escaping gravity. And I am free. Okay, I, I kind of love this one. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I like doing angry monologues. They have the most energy, I guess. It's the easiest emotion to lose yourself in when you're acting, I mean. And the arson? I mean, who hasn't thought about burning everything down and running away? <laughs> yeah. Maybe not all the murder, but still. Only maybe? I live in those moments in between maybes. Wow. 
listen, um, I just realised that was a really good one. Um, but I need to go call my mum. I haven't talked to her in a couple of weeks. Uh, I probably should do that too. Time flies when you're selling your soul for nine grand a year. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you in a bit. The Attic Monologues are written and produced by Morgan Greensmith. It is directed by Ellen Clohessy and sound designed by Wilkie Morrison and Anna Leclerc. In this episode, you heard the voices of Atlas Morgan as Nix Ryland, Anne Lorian as Bella Crow. The logo was designed by Ailey Lang. The social media is run by Son Briarwood. Find us on Twitter at Attic Monologues and on Tumblr, Instagram, and Facebook at The Attic Monologues. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review or tell a friend to listen. Any comments or questions, shoot us a message or email us at theatticmonologues at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Episode 4, Rust, will be out on Wednesday 30th of June. See you then. Can I help you? No, thank you. I know where I'm going. So you can't, ju- you can't just walk in? They're in a meeting. I don't care what happens. It doesn't change anything. I wouldn't forgive him, even if he came waltzing in here right now and groveled on his knees. Hey, you're not! I'm so sorry, Mum. He just barged through. I couldn't stop him. Nonsense. We're all friends here, aren't we? Family. I'm afraid I'll have to skip out on the groveling on my knees, but I'm sure we can still get by without it. <sighs> so, Regina, did you miss me?